Go, yep. Yep.
Она там есть еще место?
Good morning. Welcome to CISN. Um, Columbia International College loves literature. And today we have a special day. So in order for everybody to enjoy that, I would ask that now you can turn off your cell phones. Off, mute, vibrate, silent. Thank you. We read literature, we dissect it, we investigate and write about it in an attempt to somehow miraculously find cures to the issues of marginalization, assimilation, and to decode the hyphen in the character's identity. Everybody who is in English for you knows what I'm talking about. We love Canadian literature because it opens doors to intelligent conversations and it triggers thought-provoking responses. Such are the following two books that you have become familiar with, most of you, hopefully. The Headmaster's Wager, a novel inspired by the life of a grandfather, finalist for Governor General's Literary Award. Bloodletting and Miraculous Cures, a collection of short stories, winner of the prestigious Scotia Bank Killer Prize. Today, I have the privilege of introducing the author of these books, a celebrated voice in Canadian literature, Vincent Lamb, the doctor who uses literature as medicine for the soul. Welcome, Dr. Lamb. Thank you. It's really a pleasure to be here, and thank you very much for inviting me to your college. It's really an honor and a privilege to be able to speak to such an amazing and diverse group of students. I've been told that you uh, have come here from over 40 countries, which is amazing. This is sort of a, a United Nations type of educational experience, so it must be just an incredible place. Well, I think part of the reason that I first became interested in reading and in books was because you have the great privilege of being exposed to people from places other than your own experience through this school. And books offer people, and certainly offered myself, the opportunity to experience lives and worlds which were not my own. They allowed me to explore, to see, to feel, and to touch things which were not part of my everyday existence. I grew up in a very quiet, very genteel suburb of Ottawa, and I don't know if any of you have visited Ottawa, maybe on school trips or at some point during your stay in Canada, but the word quiet comes to mind when I think of Ottawa. And so when I grew up, Ottawa was even more quiet than it is now. Uh, it's always been a little bit quieter than Toronto. And I grew up in a quiet suburb of quiet Ottawa. So it was really, really uh, kind of quiet which may be sort of a code word for a little bit boring, which meant that I had a lot of time to read. And I did read, and reading is what opened up the world for me. Now, interestingly, although I was born in Canada and I grew up in Ottawa, there was another history which was very, very close to my heart and part of my experience of family history as a child growing up. My parents are ethnically Chinese, but they were born and grew up in Vietnam. And they came to Western countries. My father went to Australia first, and my mother came to Canada during the course of the conflict in Vietnam, a conflict which in this part of the world is known as the Vietnam War, and in Vietnam is known as the American War. 
So, my parents came to Canada from a different point of view, from an Asian point of view. And so it was a very odd experience when I look back. And I say this because I think we only realize that our experiences are strange in childhood when we look back, because as children, we just find all of our experiences to be completely normal. There is no other experience, and so it is uh, nothing else but completely normal. But when I look back, I sort of realize that it was kind of odd. We were the only family of any type of color for, I think, at least five blocks, five square blocks, in this quiet suburb of Ottawa. Uh, there were people, you know, whose uh, origins were in Eastern Europe, uh, or from various parts of Europe, and so who were not Anglo-Saxon. But I distinctly remember, you know, being so fascinated when I saw another Chinese person at my elementary school, and I thought, wow, that person looks really different. And then I realized, hey, I look like that. That's amazing. So this was my childhood uh, sort of demographic. And one of the things about growing up within that social environment was that it was during the 80s, and so the Cold War, this sort of political and um, theoretically impending military conflict between democratic nations and communist nations was very much in the air and was very much in the discourse of the time. And the memories of the conflict in Vietnam were also very, very fresh. Uh, and that, of course, was well understood to be a conflict between the forces of democracy and the forces of communism, as understood in the West, with the caveat that it was understood, I think, quite differently in Vietnam. But as understood in the West, that was the nature of the conflict. And it was not a conflict in which uh, quote, again, the forces of democracy had prevailed. It was an unfortunate conflict in that the forces of the West, quote, had lost. And so it was strange to grow up in that environment, to grow up in the shadow of this conflict, which was very recent and was very meaningful in the discourse of that time. And I remember um, being very, very uh, bemused at the time because the representations of the conflict in Vietnam were all representations of war. I feel like something bad is about to happen. The sense of impending doom with the uh, microphone system. Um, there were representations of war and of combatants and they were representations from a Western point of view. Uh, you know, there were films and, and TV shows which featured American soldiers in Vietnam fighting their war. And the dialogue, which we understood in our cultural context, had a lot to do with the experience of the American combatant, with people who had been drafted, with people who had draft dodged. Canada received uh, a great many uh, draft dodgers, you know, as it was termed at the time, or conscientious objectors, I think, uh, would be a more appropriate term, young American men who decided they didn't want to fight in Vietnam and who came to Canada. But this is part of the, the context. And so I, I understood the conflict from that point of view. But then, I also grew up with the stories of my family, which were very, very different. And, of course, like any family stories, there were stories about special events, and about birthdays, and about parties, and celebrations, and good things that happened, happy things that happened. Uh, and in the stories, there were sometimes features of the conflict as well. You know, my father had recollections of one instance in which there was fighting in the area of Chilong, which is where they grew up. It was a Chinese district of the area that is now Saigon. And there was fighting nearby, and you know, he recalled everyone putting the mattresses up against the windows, right? I think with the notion that that would stop bullets from entering the home. 
So there were stories that were mixed because they were very much about daily life, and yet conflict would sort of intrude upon the margins. But it was a different perspective than the perspective of the Vietnam War, which I heard about. And in the midst of those stories, there was a character who seemed to me to be very interesting. And the character was the character of my grandfather. Now, my grandfather was the proprietor of an English school in Vietnam. And as it turned out, he was in the right place at the right time. He had been educated in Hong Kong, where he learned to speak English. He went to Indochina, which was a French colony. There were not so many people who spoke English. He started an English school, which was sort of a marginal business at best, until the Americans came and made English very valuable. And then he started to make a lot of money teaching English to people who wanted to learn English in order to work for the Americans. So he made his fortune thanks to the conflict in Vietnam in a very, very real way. He was also a man who uh, did not see any particular reason to constrain his appetites. And his appetites included a uh, vast ranging appetite for a variety of women, for uh, good things to eat, for expensive alcoholic beverages, and for high stakes gambling. So you can imagine, for a teenager growing up in the quiet suburb of Nepean in the quiet city of Ottawa, it was fascinating to know that I had a grandfather who lived in this particular way. Not to say that this was without consequence, you know, and uh, you know, and uh, and I think that he occupied very much a dual role in the family history, one of uh, a cautionary tale because, in essence, he destroyed his life, lost everything he had, managed to, uh, to work his way through uh, four marriages, and ultimately uh, was left by his fourth wife um, at uh, a stage in his life when that was not very pleasant for him. So, I'm telling you this because it's not necessarily uh, the best way to go. But he occupied the role of a cautionary tale, but also the role of an example in the sense that he had been successful through education, and he had been successful through hard work. And he was sort of an example of what was possible in the modern world if you paid attention to education and if you paid attention to your business. So his professional life was the example, and his personal life was the cautionary tale. And so I was fascinated by this character and wanted to write about it. And it seemed to me that there were no characters like this in the vision of Vietnam and the vision of the conflict of Vietnam, which I heard about as I grew up. And so this was the first book that I wanted to write. And I think it very, very much grew out of my particular experience of growing up in Canada in the way that I grew up. It was a compelling and remarkable story to me because it was both part of my family history and it was so much out of keeping with the life that I knew in Canada and the way that I saw the world in Canada. I wanted to write about a conflict which the West understood in a particular way but I wanted to write about it from a totally different perspective. I was fascinated by the notion that I would write about it not even, in fact, from a Vietnamese perspective, which you would think is the natural opposite, but from a sideways perspective, that of Chinese people in Vietnam. And that's what I did. Now, the pathway there was a little bit twisted, and I talked a bit about some of my own uh, personal pathway with the writer's craft class. One of the things I also decided along the way was that I should have my own life experience in order to draw upon. And so as part of that, I decided that it would be very suitable to become a doctor. I underestimated the difficulty of the task. 
but I did become a doctor and very much fell in love with the practice of medicine. And so now I both practice medicine as well as practice the art of writing books. Before I got to the book about Vietnam, I wrote another book. I had completed medical school, I wanted to write, and I understood that the story that I had lived in becoming a doctor was a story that I could draw upon in a fictional sense to write a book of short stories about young people becoming doctors. And so I wrote Bloodletting and Miraculous Cures. I somehow got convinced along the way to write two other books as well. So I've written a biography of a very important political figure in Canada, Tommy Douglas, and a book about influenza. So I think the thing that I've realized, and which I would say to you, is that being here in Canada at this time is a very unique sort of perspective. I think to be here in a place where many cultures exist together challenges our preconceptions of how it is that people live, of what the story is supposed to be. You probably have the experience, if you're with a lot of friends who kind of see the world the way you see the, the world, you know, whether they're from the same part of the world as you, or whether maybe they're just on the same sports team, or, you know, have the same interests, it's very easy just to think, okay, you know, what everyone around me thinks must be the way it is. And I'm sure you've had the experience of meeting someone who has a different point of view, whether that difference is cultural or political. Um, and, and it causes you to stop and think, wow, I mean, that's, that's sort of a different story that this other person is telling me. And that's kind of interesting. And that's one of the great opportunities of this country, because the diversity of the place forces us to think about stories other than the stories which we naturally might find to be comfortable. And that was very much the genesis of my desire to write this particular book, The Headmaster's Wager, the realization that my understanding of a particular event, this conflict in Vietnam, from my family is very different than the dominant understanding of the world around me. I would also say to you that if you can find a way to challenge these sorts of stories that you might assume to be the case and to think about what alternatives there might be, you will find interesting territory in your life and you will find unique and original ways of looking at things. I encourage you to take advantage of that opportunity in this place because that's very much the opportunity this place offers. I would say that I feel extremely, extremely lucky to have had the opportunity to be able to pursue not one, but two passions. Both my passions in literature and my passion for medicine. And so I would say to you that if you pursue something in your life which you are passionate about and which you care about, then there's a very, very good chance that it will give you great satisfaction. So, I won't say much more. I will open it up to questions that you might have. Um, and, uh, and don't be shy, because I'm a fiction writer. So if I don't know the answer to your question, I'll just make something up. Thank you, Dr. If you have questions, those of you who have questions, please line up behind. There's a microphone in the middle. You can line up behind the microphone and ask your questions.
That's a great question. Thank you. Um, I agree with you completely. I think life is full of wagers. And I think that actually there is no good or bad to a wager because everything is a wager. Some wagers seem more safe um, and may turn out not to be. Ask any German who bought Greek bonds. Um, but, you know, we never know what the future holds. I think the danger, though, can be if you bet on things that you don't really care about, which we do a lot in this society. You know, we, um, we bet on a job that offers security, which you may not be passionate about. And that is, uh, that may be a very unsatisfying bet because you know, if you win, you get security, but were you really passionate about that? Um, or if you lose, you don't get security, and then you're left with nothing. I'm not saying that one shouldn't be passionate about security. I mean, if you're passionate about security, then you know, bet on that, right? I'm just saying that sometimes we do make bets which we're not actually passionate about. I've done it myself. Uh, so I think the question is to choose what wagers really matter. Where if you win, you win. And if you lose, then you're glad you made the bet.
Hi, Dr. Lim. I just want to ask that um, I know you're a doctor and a writer too, so how do you think that the medical career have affected your style of writing or your whole life? Thank you. That's a really, really great question. You guys have great questions. And you know, the, the great thing about medicine uh, is medicine really, really taught me to be very humble and self-critical. Um, I mean, you know, you see me standing here, sort of seems like, okay, this guy knows what he's doing, fine, right? But actually, most of the time that you spend training in medicine, uh, you feel very insecure, you're very full of self-doubt, and a lot of time you feel really sort of incompetent because you're learning some very difficult things and you're learning how to take responsibility and you're learning how to take wages with other people's lives and situations and to do it in a professionally acceptable manner but inherent in the task, that's what you're doing. So you spend a lot of time as a medical student and as a resident really, really struggling and really trying hard to learn but criticizing yourself and taking feedback from peers and from your own experience. And so that has actually helped me a lot as a writer because um, with medicine, you're very exposed to other people. If people think you've done something badly, they'll just tell you, right? If something goes badly with your patients, you'll just see. Writing is different because writing, especially if you're working on a big project like a book, you can spend years just on your own working, no feedback. And that can be quite dangerous because you can write a lot of very poor quality work and not realize it. Um, and that can hinder you in terms of moving forward and in terms of improving your work. And one of the biggest mistakes that writers can make is, you know, they, they work for on something for years, then they finally show it to someone. And the person makes valid commentary and criticism, but by that point they're so invested in it because they've spent years, literally, of their lives on it, that they cannot tolerate any feedback or criticism. And it becomes impossible for them to improve it. That's a very, very common problem with writers. Um, probably not most of the writers who you know who are successful, because those writers have figured out, I need to take feedback. I need to listen to criticism. So medicine taught me to do that every day with a very rapid feedback cycle. And so that helped me to be very critical of my own work as a writer. And then the other thing is that medicine teaches you about delayed gratification. Because you, you do three or four years of university in order to get into medical school. And you spend three or four years in medical school. And you spend two to six years as a resident. So always, you know, you're waiting, you're waiting, you're waiting. You're working hard and feeling inadequate and trying to improve for at least 10 years, right? Which is such a valuable lesson. You know, we live in sort of an instant gratification culture, and popular media would sort of have us believe that, oh, you know, you can just snap your fingers and get this and get that. My experience has been that it doesn't really work that way. You know, that really what you need to do is spend a lot of time being humble, listening, learning, improving, and then you get somewhere. And so learning that through medicine has helped me a lot in writing, because writing is very much the same thing. You basically you know, sit there and work on your thing for a few years, um, and you have to have the understanding of yourself and your understanding of the world be that if I keep on working on this, I can delay the gratification, but it will be worth having done the work. Uh, hi, sir. So, you mentioned a lot about how your life and your childhood and your family background really affected your writing and inspired your work. So, I would like to ask, has anyone else affected your work? Like, um, have you read any good books or any good authors which really made you want to write this way or write on a certain topic? Yes. I mean, the, the fundamental uh, prerequisite for writing anything is reading widely. And I think you have, to, you have to love what you read, because if you're not in love with words, then you can't summon 
enough passion to write. And it's important to read widely because you have to read the diversity of styles to know all the different ways, or at least many different ways, that it's possible for a writer to do certain things. Right? So for me, I have several personal favorites. Um, I fell in love with writing while reading Hemingway and, uh, and Steinbeck and Fitzgerald, you know, the, the American writers. Um, I began to read more widely. I read a lot of Peter Carey and a lot of Canadian writers uh, when I was sort of in my late teens. So I read a lot of Odache and Atwood um, and Monroe, uh, or Hinton Mystery. Lately, you know, I've been, I've been fascinated by Orhan Pamuk. Uh, I've begun to read Chekhov, which, you know, is one of these writers that everyone knows that they should read, but which I haven't read until now, so I've begun to read a lot of Chekhov, and Chekhov is quite amazing. Um, you know, uh, last summer I read Anna Karenina, which is fantastic. Again, you know, there's a sort of gigantic shelf full of books that we all know we should have read, but we didn't read yet, right? And so I was kind of blown away by the depth and the quality of Anna Karenina last summer. So it's a moving list, you know, it's a growing list, always. Uh, if there's people whom you should read Right now, I'm going to restrict the list of Canadians because, you know, we may as well have some sort of uh, uh, sense of place. You know, I would absolutely, I would absolutely read Rawi Haj. He's a very, very challenging voice in contemporary Canadian literature. You know, and sometimes you'll probably pick up the book and say, what the hell is he talking about? Uh, which is good, right? You know, I think good writing should challenge and should be uncomfortable sometimes. Uh, there, there are great books coming out now by young writers. I would, uh, I would definitely, definitely read Miriam Taves. I mean, she has a challenging new novel about what it is to, to want to die. And that's a challenging, uncomfortable topic. And I would read about that. Uh, there's a lot of great Canadian books out there, as, as well as great books around the world. And one of the great things about being interested in books is there's a vast territory to explore. The territory is bigger than you will ever be able to explore, and so it offers infinite possibilities. Thank you. Uh, hello, Dr. Lam. Uh, the question of me is that uh, you mentioned your grandfather was the headmaster, right? And uh, in your book, The Headmaster Witch, uh, is that your grandfather was the original character that made you have the idea to write that book or make that character? Yes, very much so. My grandfather uh, is absolutely the inspiration for the main character in that book. But what I discovered as I wrote it, because I tried to write things that were quite close to his life, and I found it was actually quite difficult to do it. And I find this with a lot of my writing. Even though I know about something, I actually have to write it differently to make it work on the page. So the events in the book are fictional. Um, and the best way to probably express it is they rhyme with the events of my grandfather's life but they're not the events of his life. And I think that's often how I approach things as a writer. Thank you. Uh, hi, Mr. Lam. Um, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is about, earlier when you were speaking, you spoke about uh, writing from the Chinese point of view, being sideways to what was happening with the Vietnamese war. So, why would you say the Chinese point of view was sideways? Oh, sure. So what I mean by that was that the, well, first of all, it should be said the conflict was not as simple as many in the West would have understood. Many in the West understood it as a conflict between democracy and communism. And it was not so simple at all. From the point of view of the Vietnamese, most of them, although, they were fighting for a communist regime, I think would have characterized the reason that they're fighting as more of a nationalist fight and a fight for independence. Now, the origins of 
the political movement which became the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong was really an anti-colonialism movement. And it was really directed originally, before the Americans became involved, against the colonial presence of the French. And so all these forces were at work. And ultimately, as in most wars, people who are fighting on their home soil simply wished to defend their own families and their livelihoods. And that's probably true of both people fighting on the South Vietnamese side as well as people on the North Vietnamese side. It's just that they had different interpretations of what it meant to fight for their homes and their families. Now the Chinese had a particular role in Vietnam at the time. The Chinese had had very much a standoffish presence in Indochina. They had been there, but they lived apart. So for example, my parents grew up in a place called Cholot. Cholot was very much sort of a sister city to Saigon at the time. Now it's really been included in greater Saigon, and you know, it's part of Saigon proper. But at the time, it was really sort of an alternate world. And it was a world in which you could speak Chinese, you could grow up um, speaking only Chinese, going to Chinese schools, eating Chinese food. And so the Chinese had established this sort of alternate presence in Vietnam and had sort of similar uh, presences in many places in Southeast Asia. So they were very much apart. Um, although there were Chinese people of many classes, much of the involvement with Vietnam, I think it's fair to say, was a commercial involvement. So, uh, so there were very prosperous Chinese people who owned businesses uh, and who controlled industries in Vietnam. Not to say that there were not other people who did so as well, but that was their involvement. So when I say sideways, I mean that their perspective on Indochina was always one of outsiders. You know, they, they lived there, but I think it's fair to say that most Chinese people who lived in Vietnam, say in the first half of the 20th century, would have viewed themselves as being very much apart from the Vietnamese. They would have talked about the Vietnamese, and they would have talked about the Chinese, and they would have drawn very clear differences. And so the conflict which took place, you know, was really something which they had no vested interest in, because they were not Vietnamese, right? They were not, you know, either, um, pro this party or anti that party. They wanted to do business and you know, to live as they had lived, which is to say to live as Chinese people in Vietnam. And so, so that's why I say that I wanted to write from a sideways perspective, because I think it was the perspective of that group of people at that time. Okay. So, thank you. So, sorry, so my question is, um, in one of the YouTube videos you made, you advise young writers to write from what they know. So, uh, in your book, like, my question is, how do you write from what you know? Like, in your book, uh, Blood Letting America Lost Cures, Ming and her supposed boyfriend, they are two different traits, two very different traits. So, do you just take one trait from yourself and put in one person, take one trait from yourself, put in the other person? Or do you, like, immerse all your characters, all your attributes into one person and then Right, that way you know how it's gonna like react, like how they're gonna react to each other and stuff. Well, another great question. I think if you ask, you know, a few writers, you'll probably get a whole bunch of different answers. So there's no one way, and ultimately, I think every writer, yourself included, will have to find their way. I'll tell you what I do. So what I do is I write from what I know, but not exactly the way I know it. And I write it differently, in the sense that I write it trying to take a perspective slightly outside of my own life. For example, uh, so those characters, Ming and Fitz, and there's two more characters who are sort of the main characters of that book, Chen and Sri, I mean, they all have particular kind of traits. And all of them, when I was writing them, I thought of as having traits of myself drawn to an extreme. So, you know, I think most of us have an experience that, you know, one day we may feel one way, another day we may feel another way. You know, one day the world is great, everyone, 
you know, is lovable, uh, is full of peace and, and satisfaction and, you know, everything is amazing. And another day, everything's going terribly, you know, the world is all against you, uh, it's all horrible and evil, right? Same person, you can have different days. I think all of us have that experience. And so for me as a writer, you know, what I do is try to draw from each of those aspects. I do try to distract it from my actual experience. So in the case of, of Ming and Fitz, Sri and Chen, you know, I try to exaggerate certain traits of myself, which I know to exist for each of them. Um, I told you for the Headmaster's Wager, you know, I tried to write about a certain time and place in a way that rhymed with the truth, but was not the truth. And I do that because I find for me, you know, I've tried to write things the way it actually happened. Um, and it doesn't really work for me. And I think it doesn't really work because I can't achieve sufficient distance from my own experience of the event in order to actually write it well. As a writer, you know, you're taking your vision, putting it on the paper, in words, you know, in abstract symbology, letters, spaces, grammar, etc., and hoping that someone else will look at those and translate them into an inner experience, right? So I find that I need to be able to read it as an outside party, to be able to understand whether someone can actually have an imagined experience from reading it. So if I've written exactly what I experienced, I then find it very, very difficult to assess my own work or to even represent it in a way that's satisfying and meaningful for someone else. So for me, it's actually very, very important that it's not exactly what I experienced, but I'm altering it in some way, and that enables me to actually perform the abstraction task um, of choosing words which make sense to someone else. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna have really short, crunchy answers. I have a tendency to ramble, which I'm doing now, but I'll just bring that in. Go on. If it was a haunted house, were there any traumatic events that were very significant and help you to become a writer? I have to say that I've been remarkably fortunate uh, and had an absence of traumatic events. And I think trauma can be helpful for some writers. Uh, I also, through my work as a doctor, know lots and lots of people who have had terrible trauma, uh, for whom that trauma has really inhibited them from doing many kinds of work. Um, so, you know, I would wish for a world in which there was no trauma, but certainly, you know, I have to say that I've been, I've been very lucky not to have acute traumas. You know, I've had I've had my difficulties, like most people do. Nothing I would call a big trauma. Thank you. Good morning, Dr. Lam. Uh, I, I want to know what's the most uh, significant moral you want to express through your book, The uh, Headmaster's Pleasure. Right. What's the moral of the story? Um, I always try to dodge that question, you know, because I, I want I want people I don't want people to read in a way that's handicapped by me telling them what they should get out of it. Um, so uh, so I think the best answer I can give is that is that there are there are a few possible morals. How's that? Thank you. Hello, doctor. I'm an English for your student and I have to write a lot of the essays. Uh, my, question, my question is, uh, what will you do uh, when you are writing a new book and uh, uh, how do you get inspirations and uh, when you feel confused in writing a new book, what will you do? Thank you. Sure, I think that you should always be inspired by things that fascinate you. Now I realize it's tough. For you because you're given an essay and maybe you know maybe you have to write an essay about something that you're not fascinated about but if that's the case try to find some small aspect of it that is really interesting genuinely interesting because if you find something that's really interesting 
you know, then you can work on it meaningfully. And otherwise, otherwise it's very difficult to do. Thank you, Rebecca. Hello, sir. I want to ask you a question about the headmaster maker. Uh, because the father, uh, the headmaster, in order to uh, save, save money for his son, and he uh, gamble a lot. And I want to ask uh, why you choose the headmaster maker, especially maker, as the title of the book. I think I chose the book title. Uh, well, I'll tell you exactly how I actually chose it. I read the book, and it had a totally different name. And I won't tell you because it wasn't a very good name. Okay. And so then I had about four other names. You know, uh, the headmaster, the headmaster's wager, and two other names involving gold. Uh, so which one do you think is the best one for this book? Well, I think the headmaster's wager is the best because I chose it. <laughs> but the way I chose it is I went to a wedding and you know, after everyone had a few drinks, you know, I went to all my relatives at the wedding and I said, okay, I've written a book. They know I'm a writer, so they weren't surprised. And they said, I'm not going to tell you anything about the book, but which of these titles interests you the most? And I just went, you know, around the reception room and asked all these groups of people, what do you think? And almost everyone, you know, after I gave them the four options, said the headmaster's wager. So I said, okay, fine. Well, that's, that must be the right choice. Thank you. So we're reading a book about Chinese people trying to assimilate into Canadian culture, especially at a critical time period in the China Japanese War. Um, and I'm sure at one point in your life you at least witnessed or faced marginalization. So my question is, um, do you think we have come far in terms of racism and accepting other people? And if not, where do you think we need to improve? Well, I think we have come far in the sense that racism in this country is not acceptable at a formal level. So that's progress in a way. I mean, if we look at most human history, you know, most countries and societies have been profoundly racist, including, including Chinese society. Um, so I think in that sense we've come very far. I think you know, there is still some distance to be traveled. I think we have very subtle forms of racism in Canada. Um, so we we express it differently. And for instance, you know, I think there, there is discrimination in this country based on accent. So if you um, are whatever color and you have you know, a perfect native Canadian accent, you know, I do think that can result in a different understanding of you, a different perception in the professional world uh, than certain other accents. You know, if you're a person of whatever color, interestingly, you know, I think there's also sort of a geographic distribution to our, our sense of discrimination. You know, I think if you are of any color and you have a perfect BBC British accent, you know, you will be treated differently and better than if you had accents from, uh, from certain other parts of the world, you know, including, frankly, an Asian accent. Right, so, so I think we've become more subtle in the ways in which we discriminate, but I think that it still exists. Um, and, you know, there's no sense in pretending otherwise. The question is really, you know, how do we move forward? And one of the greatest challenges in, in our immigration policy is that we bring a lot of people to this country who have very impressive educational backgrounds and then our society, our economy, our system of professional qualifications does not provide a route for them to gain employment which is in accordance with their professional qualifications. That leads to a lot of disenfranchisement and a lot of frustration. And it is kind of an implicit form of racism. You know, so I think, I think we do have to recognize that these things exist and we have to work on them. I have to tell you, I, uh, I remember once I was about 10 or 11 you know, in my quiet suburb of Ottawa. And, you know, I was riding my bicycle, and these teenagers pulled up. So at this point, they were older than me. They pulled up my car, and they, you know, slowed down the car, and they rolled down the windows, and they were kind of, you know, going alongside me. 
And then they started yelling, right? And they started yelling, you know, fucking gook, go home. Right, yelling, yelling, yelling. And I was terrified, you know, I was on a bicycle and these people were in a car and I didn't know if they were going to run me over or whatever. And so, you know, finally they, they sped away and I was, I was terrified that I'd stop and my, my heart was pounding. And then I thought to myself, wait a minute. The gooks were the North Vietnamese. They're totally wrong. My family's from South Vietnam. And my family's not even Vietnamese. They're Chinese from Vietnam. You know, those guys are idiots. Right? Which is to demonstrate that I think that what we do also in Canada is, um, you know, we often intellectualize things. Right? And at a certain level, we can sort of, you know, claim a sense of intellectual comfort that people who are racist and discriminatory you know, are intellectually mistaken. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily address the reality that we do have issues today. Thank you. So for instance, in the Headmaster's Wager, I wrote another 50 pages, but I didn't publish them. I cut it off. Right? So every writer will, will choose, uh, choose these things differently. But I would say as a rule of thumb, if the energy of the writing is dissipating, then you should stop. For me, rarely. Mm -hmm. For me, sometimes I have an idea of the ending, but it's rarely the same once I get there. Because writing it is an act of exploration and, and travel for me. So by the time I get there, it's different. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much, everyone. Great questions. Thank you, Dr. Lamb. I would ask that some wonderful gentlemen who want to be heroes today stay back and help us put the chairs back. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of this beautiful day.